I can probably start with <clears throat> telling the people what the session is all about while Christo is finding his way to us. Uh, so welcome everyone to this first session of the Big Reset. Uh, it's called No Time Today, and we're going to talk about how to overcome, overcome the crisis mindset. In this session, you can explore a bit more the mindset and the mission of Endeavor Bulgaria, the organization that is making sure the high impact ventures here are reaching their full market potential here and abroad. And it's also quite dedicated to spreading the give back mentality. Hi, Christo, to the community. Hi, guys. Hey, it's all looking fresh. Hello, hello. Yeah. <laughs> I will give some updates on Christo and Munchio in a bit, um, but let me just give a bit more, more overview on Endeavor. So, as I said, uh, the organization is dedicated to helping companies um, reach their full potential and also spread the uh, give back culture in Bulgaria and among entrepreneurs. How are they doing that? By selecting, mentoring and accelerating the best high impact entrepreneurs here. Endeavor is a global organization that was started in 1997 and already has offices in 40, 40 countries. Uh, and the local chapter was started in 2016, uh, supporting companies with real impact and those who have the potential to grow and create jobs is also part of the mission of Endeavor. And I think it will also be interesting to talk to the guys from this perspective, given the current situation. So my guests, are Mumchil Vasilev and Christo Christov, who you see, Mumchil is the managing director of Endeavor Bulgaria and brings along uh, 20 years of extensive managerial and business development experience in wide range of industries from aviation, petrochemicals, mining, constructions to renewable energy. He's also the co-founder of Proviti, a company focused on generate, uh, generation and development of biotechnical biotech uh, innovation in the area of nutrition. Christo Christoph is the CEO of HR Capital, a private equity company with focus on marketplace and commerce digital businesses. In 2005, he founded the digital news site Direct News, which later was acquired by NetInfo, creating the biggest digital media company in Bulgaria. During his time at NetInfo, the company grew three times and entered new verticals. Um, Christo is also an investor. He invests in fintech, legal tech, and marketplace, and recently also health tech, but he'll probably tell us a bit more about that later. He is a limited partner into VC funds, Levant and the Endeavor Catalyst 2 fund. And Christo is also the newest member of the board of directors of Endeavor. So guys, hello, yeah. welcome to your own <laughs> session. <laughs> How are you doing? Thanks, Alex. Great, absolutely great. It's a lovely day. Yeah, Hello. happy to be there. Yeah. So before we uh, dig deeper into the topic of entrepreneurial mindset, I would only ask you to give a bit more context uh, about um, Endeavor and Momchi. Could you briefly walk us through the story of Endeavor Bulgaria? You're present here for four years now, if I'm correct. Um, your network of entrepreneurs is growing. You've done a field exploration, meaning you went around Bulgaria to search for innovative companies. And I think that's quite important uh, to share too, because uh, uh, we don't want to be Sofia centric. True, so. true. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Alex. Um, indeed, it's been a bit more than four years since uh, Endeavor uh, set up uh, an affiliate in Bulgaria. Uh, of course, the, the local affiliate is uh, true to the global mission of Endeavor, as uh, you described it earlier. And we are indeed um, dedicated uh, in um, uh, dedicated to identify those so-called high impact entrepreneurs, uh, the ones that uh, we believe truly have the potential to impact uh, and to change uh, the society, the economy for the better. Uh, of course, I'm a strong believer in uh, uh, in the fact that uh, entrepreneurship as a, as a state of mind does have the, uh, the capacity and the strength to change um, uh, society and the economy. And uh, we are looking to find those founders um, that have this uh, profile of being ambitious, being um, uh, open-minded, and also, very importantly, um, have the give back mentality, have the mentality to spread um, uh, their success 
to to the next generation and actually help others to uh, to to grow. And this is one of the the main, I would say, features the main uh, characteristics of, uh, of of a high impact entrepreneur. And in times like this, uh, the ones that we're experiencing now, it's even uh, even more relevant now. Yeah, just a quick remark. Um... Endeavor is focused on more mature companies that are right at their inflection point, meaning they're ready to scale up. But recently they also started a program for uh, more earlier stage uh, companies, which is called Dare to Scale. They already had their first season and uh, several success stories from there. Um, and the next season is coming up. It's gonna, the application is starting in June, if I'm correct. Oh, oh. And we'll make sure we uh, share more information as a follow up. So, Christo. Just yesterday, you were officially announced the newest member of the board of directors of Endeavor. But you, you've been yeah. part of Endeavor in different roles uh, ever since the beginning. In any case, how is, uh, what is your new responsibility there? How is your role changing? Is it? Well, in general, it's, uh, I don't know, uh, for me, it's a little bit new, so won't you will be able to say better, but for me it's not really changing because it's uh, it's all a matter of giving back to the to the ecosystem that you're a part of and that uh, we all receive the benefits and we all need to share the let's say the tough times and hard times so uh, so for me it's always been a matter of uh, of giving back uh, and uh, now maybe it will be a little bit uh, accelerated maybe it will be a little bit more uh, with a little bit more of uh, responsibilities, uh, but uh, but generally the the concept is the same. I've been uh, part of the network uh, since 2016, uh, so it's uh, four years now. And for me, this is a, a natural step to step up uh, my game and uh, and really find even more ways to uh find the new the new outliers find the new uh, growing companies that can really really explode and uh, become global businesses i can probably sum up uh, christos new role um, with two quotes one from um, our founder linda rottenberg um, she she's now keeps saying that when the economy turns down entrepreneurs turn up so that's what christo did actually so <laughs> and um, the second quote is from um, Vasco Tereziev, who we all know, who is currently a co-chairman of Endeavor. And um, he explains this um, role uh, with the three levels of happiness um, of an entrepreneur. The first one is uh, you are happy to have a job that pays you well. The second level where you can afford uh, to do what you like without being paid for it. And the third level is when you actually pay to to do what you like. So Christopher is at the, uh, arriving at the third stage of <laughs> happiness. <laughs> so yeah. great! After this quick well intro put. and inspiring quotes, um, let's dive in because we are going to talk about mindset here. Um, and it's been around two months after we realized something was coming at us. Ever since. Um, uh, we in the rather innovative ecosystem been talking about opportunities for the business, not about not so much about the challenges. Uh, but in any case, I guess uh, the first thoughts were quite different. So I want to challenge you with, with this first question. What are your first thoughts, but really first thoughts when you realize what's going on? Visto? Well, um, mm, I in the beginning it was maybe a little bit uh, scary so at front i was uh, scared because uh, uh, when you're building something you 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 never look uh, in the next uh, like one or two months you always look further so you look like nine months 18 months and when you have this path uh, ahead of you which together with the team that you have assembled you're growing you're going uh, to, on that path and you're going towards that goal, uh, basically, uh, 
path. So it it cuts off one road, it shuts down uh, another. So so in the beginning you're scared because what you were thinking that you're going to be doing and uh, you'll be achieving uh, and uh, your pipeline, so to say, for the next uh, 18 months, uh, you see it uh, totally destroyed. So, so my very fir first thought was, uh, was fear. Okay, we lost your picture, Hristo. I hope um, you will come. Do you hear my voice? <laughs> we hear you at least. Yeah, that's uh, enough to re recover the picture. So, Momchi, what's the first thought? Well, uh, more or less the same sort of path of uh, thinking and behavior because we are all humans so uh, it's uh, only natural to uh, to react in a human way um, initially it was i admit partially denial um, as most people around the world you know, you think it ha it's something that is happening somewhere else to somebody else uh, and it won't come to you but then it comes so uh, second uh, reaction was indeed a little bit of fear uh, because it is a little bit overwhelming. The, 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 uh, the gravity and the scale of it uh, suddenly becomes a little bit overwhelming. Um, and, uh, and then a little bit of confusion, inevitable. Okay, so uh, fear uh, and confusion. Uh, absolutely. And then um, what eventually surfaced up is also a little bit of curiosity because this is probably the biggest social experiment um, uh, that um, we, we will ever live through. Uh, so it's really exciting a little bit to see what's going on. So, right. And, and, uh, and what and was, I can, uh, if I, I may ask the question? I can add to the fear Go factor ahead. that um, when speaking to older people than me who have more experience, uh, they shared with me that uh, in their lifetimes, they have never experienced uh, uh, like a lockdown event, uh, you know, so almost uh, the state of uh, like a state of emergency, almost like military state. Uh, but so they have never experienced uh, a state of emergency. So when you when you see that uh, in the matter of like uh, 60 years, uh, nothing uh, has happened uh, on that scale, you, you obviously uh, get a little fearful. Mm. And guys, uh, after you uh, started thinking about uh, the businesses you're running and as entrepreneurs, what was the first sober thought that you had? We were actually anyway preparing for a session anytime soon, weren't we? True, true. Uh, so in that sense, probably the, my first sober thought, as you, as you called it, uh, was referring to my favorite book, uh, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Uh, and its uh, main message, don't panic. Uh, so uh, it's really about uh, trying to put, uh, put your mind uh, together uh, and your thoughts together and uh, really assess the situation. And then, um, as you said, um, uh, we were sort of expecting something like this. Uh, so it was, for me, it was uh, trying to, to put everything into a little bit of context. Um, I started sort of referring back to uh, to the history a little bit and see what's going on there, what have happened there. Um, and indeed, uh, the, the main conclusion was that we will go through this one way or another. Um, the universe doesn't care about us uh, that much. So uh, things are happening with or without us. So we better, uh, you know, uh, get, get to act on this. Uh, as you mentioned, recessions, uh, going back to the history, in, in the last 70 years, there's been um, 12 recessions in, in the U.S. Using the U.S. As, um, as sort of the leading economy in the post-war world. Uh, so it, this means that there's been um, a recession almost every five years um, that lasts about a year or so. And... Um, since our last recession, we had about 10 years of continuous growth, which is kind of extraordinary. So it's only natural now that there will be a correction. Um, this correction, of course, is now, and it will be a big correction. You know, there's a Foucault law uh, saying that uh, the bigger their uh, 
the deviation, then the correction is uh, is even bigger, is even stronger. Uh, so um, this is what we can expect. It just happened that we had this event. It could have been something else, uh, but we had this one. Uh, so we now have to do the math and uh, start solving the um, one problem after another, as uh, Matt Damon put it in The Martian. Well, obviously, no time today. At least that's the title you gave to your session. What is it time for, Krista? <laughs> well, uh, referring back to your previous uh, question, you're right that uh, uh, we were expecting something like that. So a bull market continuing 10 years uh, uh, is not so usual, like Momchi said. Uh, and uh, we didn't know where it was going to come from, but we knew that it was coming. And the way we had been preparing is obviously uh, and this is this has been done by also the major uh, worldwide investors. Mm, there is an index that you can monitor, like how much cash, uh, uh, like uh, BlackRock, like Warren Buffett keep, and uh, they were keeping uh, serious amounts of cash. So basically, we weren't that uh, innovative, and we were uh, sort of doing the same. <laughs> and after the initial panic and the fear. Uh, came another fear and panic, which is, uh, okay, which are the sectors of the economy which are going to survive and even grow in these harsh times? And uh, 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 how can we quickly uh, enter those sectors, um, either through investments or through organic building of business? And uh, so, so we were in a sort of scramble of... Uh, uh, let's find the best companies that are going to outlive and uh, uh, double or triple or even 10x uh, in size uh, over the next uh, three years. All right. Um, what was the... So it's a time. It's a time for investment. Okay. Probably and also. And it's uh, it's not it's not running out. It's not running out. Uh, it's going to be over the next uh, 18 months or so. It's going to be, a, uh, the next 18 months are going to be a very good time for investments. Investments in those sectors you mentioned. Yes, I, I think that, uh, I think that um, especially interesting are sectors that have, uh, uh, let's say that have been more dominantly physical business uh, driven, but which at the same time have the opportunity to go, uh, to, to have the business in digital. So, for example, if you're a hotel, obviously you're a physical business, uh, there is not much uh, digital transformation that you can do. So you cannot deliver the service via digital. But if you're an event organization, uh, obviously you can deliver the events in digital. If you're a hospital, obviously you can deliver services in digital. Um, if you're uh, a traditional, let's say, media uh, obviously, you can deliver services in digital. So, we are looking for those sectors that can can be digitally transformed uh, and can grow their uh, their digital presence during this. You are now, uh, as far as I understand it, speaking from the perspective of an investor, because you said invest in those sectors. Um, what about the entrepreneurs? What should they be looking for when they have already established business that? Probably part of it is uh, quite hard hit. How should they pivot? What would you advise them, both of you? Well, a uh, couple of things. Um, uh, pivoting is, of course, um, might be um, might be a necessary option in some cases. As Fritz uh, mentioned, there are businesses that um, inevitably in the next. Um, year and a half, two years probably are going to be very hard hit, like the tourism, like travel. And it's actually going to be very interesting to see what kind of um, new business models will come up um, out of uh, out of these sectors. But for the rest, um, I think it's um, um, it's actually golden times for, for entrepreneurs because the crisis itself creates a lot of problems. And uh, the biggest problem the, the biggest uh, issue with uh, the entrepreneurship is actually to 
um, to come up with a solution to a big enough pro problem. Well, now we have a lot of problems. So um, there are lots of opportunities out there to, to solve. And uh, as Christus mentioned there, uh, the way we're gonna solve them is probably the key to, to success. Digitalization, definitely, and everything related to this, uh, meaning um, uh, data management, um, cybersecurity, all these related uh, topics, um, virtualization, as again, Christo mentioned as well, lots of things are gonna have to be uh, virtual these days. Um, probably also shorter supply chains um, and um, and this centralization. So when we were discussing with, with our entrepreneurs um, possible scenarios, we we're always talking about um, probably one of these or combination of uh, several of these um, features that uh, their their businesses should uh, should address. I remember at the very beginning of everything, we had an interview with Christo who said, um, uh, look at what you already have and probably there is an issue underestimated or was not uh, mature enough at that point. And can you like elaborate a bit on that for the audience? Yeah, I, I, uh, for example, um, I have a friend who, uh, who is in, uh, in retail uh, who has uh, various proper, uh, you know, uh, locations throughout the country. And uh, uh, obviously now with uh, all the shopping malls uh, locked down and uh, uh, footfall not happening uh, in these locations, um, he also has uh, an online uh, uh, shop. And this online shop, uh, it has been growing steadily uh, over the last like five years. Uh, but it is uh, representing not more than it was representing not more than than like uh, ten percent of the sales. So now what uh, what he did during the crisis uh, is uh, he uh, obviously the locations uh, a lot of them were shut down you know on purpose. Uh, he took a look at all of the locations that he had and he decided to cut the bottom 30% of the of the re retail locations and uh, reinvest that money in the in the digital asset and uh, by doing so uh, the digital asset has been able to to double in size over the last uh, uh, two months uh, or so and uh, what he's going to take from this is uh, the the last 30 percent in his uh, you know physical uh, uh, retail stores uh, they are going to remain shut so he's still going to continue to grow the the digital part of uh, of his business so this is the this is uh, an example of a, a physical slash digital business pivoting to more digital in the in the in the portfolio all right and because i think it's quite important and interesting actually and useful to continue speaking through examples uh, maybe you could share a bit uh, what were the first uh, conversations and discussions in the local network of endeavor uh, first the local then we'll talk a bit more about the global and what were the main concerns of the entrepreneurs uh, in endeavor in the beginning and how have they evolved throughout the past two months well the um, the first sort of um, so i have to say that we we are a little bit lucky um, because we have this um, um affiliates all over the world some of the affiliates of Endeavor uh, are uh, in countries that were hit hard earlier on. Uh, so we had this uh, wormhole uh, in our system where we were able actually to see a little bit into the future. Uh, and speaking to, uh, to our colleagues uh, from Spain, from Italy, um, we were able actually to uh, to get a um, to shorten this um, period of denial or period of shock or whatever, and uh, get quickly to the realization of what really is going on. Um, and based on this, we um, uh, we thought that um, the best thing initially what we can do for for our entrepreneurs is actually to help them be informed, um, help them to gather 
adequate information from reliable first-hand uh, experience sources uh, that would allow them to uh, assess uh, the situation uh, objectively. So that's what we did. We tried to, uh, to gather such information from all over our network and created um, a data room, a database uh, for our entrepreneurs. It's still uh, active and um, there they could uh, get uh, information on all sorts of issues mm -hmm. from uh, managing their teams to uh, um, to cash flow management to actually handling the, the health situation as such. So that was the first thing and uh, that was very helpful. We were and then we made sure that we were in constant contact with our, uh, with our entrepreneurs just to to help, to help them be informed and to help them overcome this stress period as quickly as possible. Then the second um, uh, major effort uh, that we undertook was to help them um, stay um, stay liquid um, and help them uh, if they haven't had them already uh, generate some uh, liquidity buffers. Luckily, I would say that uh, because of the uh, the culture. Of the, of, of the companies that we work with, uh, most of them were very well prepared. In fact, we do have in our portfolio now companies that are, as Christo said, they're in, the, in expansion mode, in, in investment mode. They're looking for opportunities out there. Uh, the rest were quite quick uh, to, uh, to generate some buffers and to strengthen their, uh, their discipline, cash flow discipline. And alongside with that, that's what we try to help them with uh, proper mentorship from people who have been through uh, such crises before. So they, they knew uh, what, the upper, um, uh, what the proper mode of behavior would be. And then of course, helping them to communicate with uh, banks and investors uh, to provide this uh, necessary immediate, uh, immediate help which luckily actually um, put most of them into uh, very good uh, shape currently. Um, and really, have, I can also share in this sense another war story um, of one of our companies, uh, Scapto, the burger chain. Um, I'm really um, proud of them because obviously they're in a business that was hard, hard hit from the very beginning. But they managed to turn around their business model in two weeks and um, accelerate, as Christo said, trends that were, uh, were already there, but for one reason or another were not a priority before. In their case, that was the delivery business. And in only two, two weeks, they actually managed to structure and boost their delivery business, um, be innovative, uh, by using um, third-party providers, uh, also issuing uh, burger bonds, uh, bonds uh, that you can probably notice. And as a result of this, their month of April was a record month of April in all of their history. Oh, wow. With zero physical sales, only sales going through their delivery. And that shows resilience, shows um, agility, which I think is the key for not just survival here, but actually taking, uh, making use of some of the opportunities on the market now. Mm. Yeah, agility is definitely a key word here. Um, and because this whole session is on mindset, there is probably no guidebook. What are the particular steps and actions that you need to be taking in order to go through such a situation, but it's probably much more the mindset. Can you share some thoughts on that? What mindset you need uh, in terms of uh, to, to go through this uh, like next uh, one or two yeah, years? Yeah, let's I mean. start with that. And we can dig deeper after. Well, well, I think I think uh, I think uh, agility and also resilience. I think we must uh, arm ourselves with patience because uh, I I got to hear it uh, quite often uh, during these last uh, uh, two months that um, there are some you know high expectations that that uh, the economy is going to recover super quickly. 
or that uh, things are going to be go back to normal in September or something like that. So uh, if you have such expectations, you might uh, be, you might feel uh, down and depressed uh, if it doesn't happen. that it's not going to be a very quick recovery. Uh, at the best case, it's going to be a U-shape, uh, but most probably it's going to be a W-shape. So uh, I would say uh, arm yourselves with uh, patience, have, um, uh, have, uh, have a view on the long run. Uh, don't be focused only on the next uh, like one or two months uh, and uh, uh, to prepare to go back to normal in, uh, in September. Maybe it's not going to happen uh, this way. So uh be prepared for the long run and use the time use the time that you have to sort of uh, a little bit think uh, on your priorities on your strategy on your clients on your uh, value proposition uh, on the added value that you give to the to the to the market because uh in this period of uncertainty uh the products and uh, value propositions that are going to be accepted are the ones that are uh, more in the you know, in the likes of the need uh, rather than the want. So, if you're in luxury brand or if you're uh, you know, if you're selling something which is not of uh, high need of the people, it is normal that uh, you're going to have a decrease in sales. And maybe for you, it's better to decrease your cost base and to wait for uh, better times, unless you find uh, a segment or a niche which is still willing to, to buy these products. For example, uh, I have another example of a Bulgarian entrepreneur who is in the, um, uh, who is manufacturing and uh, in the retail of uh, furniture. And what he told me is that uh, he has a uh, 40% uh, decrease uh, in the total turnover. But within this 40%, it's very interesting that the upper, upper segment of products that he's selling remains unchanged. So uh, the more expensive products, uh, the people with uh, more money, they continue buying. The less expensive, which are aimed for the uh, mass uh, population, uh, they are the ones that are decreasing. So um, you must find uh, the niche within your market and uh, value proposition, which can continue to either grow or uh, flatten and be the same and stick on to it uh, during this uh, uh, during these times. But if you're in the meat economy, like uh, scap to R, because obviously people need to eat, um, then uh, then this is a massive growth opportunity for you. I'm only going to echo what Christo is saying. Um, again, I think the, ma the main message here is um, don't waste a good crisis here. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, we humans tend to be kind of temporal, uh, suffer from this temporal short-sightedness. Um, in the, in the, when the times are good and um, uh, as well, we think we are immortal. And, um, and when um, we face uh, some challenge, we think the, the world's going to end tomorrow. Neither of the two is, is true. It's a, as Chris to say, uh, we have a long run, and we have to stay le relevant with our value proposition to to our customers. Um, and uh, as long as you remain relevant with what you are solving uh, as an issue, um, there is a there is a very good opportunity for for the businesses to thrive in this situation. Um, yes. Another good feature of the crisis situation, I guess, is um, that people become more reasonable. Um, I, I, I don't refer to the current, you know, the panic state, uh, people drinking bleach and, and everything else. Uh, but uh, entrepreneurs generally are uh, very sensible people. And in times like this, um, they come to their basics uh, and uh, trying to address the real needs. Um, so think about your, your buffers, your long-term reserves, your long-term value proposition, um, and uh, try to be alert, you know, on everything that's going on. We mentioned some trends, uh, that, um, uh, 
uh, that probably are going to highlight it by the crisis. So try to use them, and um, and customers will become more more reasonable too. After all, they will start they will start to value more the content rather than the form. And we see it with some of our companies as well. Um, even in uh, as Christian mentioned, uh, the retail and the luxury brands, because there are levels of luxury, obviously. Or one of our star companies, uh, by far, for example, um, actually experience um, quite a quite a hike in their in their sales currently, because people started to appreciate even more so um, the quality and the message the product brings to them rather than just the brand. And, um, and they're facing some real um, boom in their sales. Another example is, uh, is a company of ours called Tiger Technology operating in cloud, uh, in, um, cloud storage um, solutions. Um, and the mantra that used to be relevant before that uh, no CIO was fired because of buying IBM or SAP uh, is probably no longer that valid, and they see quite a hike in the demand for for their products and services currently. Right. Um, I'll ask a bit more unpopular question here, and you don't have to name uh, the companies if there are such. But um, have you noticed some major mistakes that the companies from your network did, or if not in your network? If you have other examples, that is also welcome. Um, yes, um, one popular mistake um, is again um, the prolonged period of denial. Um, especially, and that's a, you know, being prepared for this kind of situation is both blessing, but it might be also a, a little bit of a curse, because if you have accumulated some decent reserves over the last couple of years. And you enter this situation, you're willing to long longer, to wait longer, um, in the hope that the things will come back to the old normal. Uh, and they don't. They're, they're not going to come uh, to the, the old normal. So this um, speed of action uh, is sometimes lost, and we're pushing our um, our companies to try to think about this and to actually work about work on, on accumulating some buffers. Whether they need them currently or not, uh, they will need them a little bit later. If not for survival, hopefully, but for investing in new opportunities. And it's now the time to actually accumulate these uh, additional buffers that will put them in front of the wave later on. And uh, you, you have to be really quick in in uh, in doing in doing so. Uh, what I would uh, what I would add to that is that uh, everything has changed. So the way that you have been doing your business uh, until you know yesterday uh, is not the same uh, as of today. So one part of the change is uh, is obviously the marketing budgets. So marketing budgets have been uh, uh, super tight. Uh, and they have been uh, really cut, which uh, which uh, to some extent uh, gives opportunity to the uh, to to companies that couldn't get their message out there when the cost per click was super expensive and the reach was super expensive to take advantage of those channels now. So if you have a product which uh, uh, is delivering. Uh, uh, good value to the to the people right now in at this particular moment. Now for you, it's easier to reach uh, more people through digital advertising than than you were previously able to to reach. Why? Because you have whole industries that are that are not advertising. You don't see booking. You don't see Airbnb. You don't see Skyscanner. You don't see flight. You don't see Wizzair. You don't see sports betting that much. So you have whole categories that are outside of the of the marketing funnel and they are obviously much lower bidding pressure and much lower uh, price uh, uh, to reach uh, new new customers so if you are in a segment that um, that is uh, that is growing or if one part of your business can be growing 
uh, uh, you should totally scratch your marketing mix, which was uh, up until yesterday, and reconfigure it uh, uh, to fit this part of the business that is uh, that is really growing. Because now you can now you can reach much more people at a lower cost. So if I'm that's, a, that's absolutely a great point. I just want to reiterate what history is saying um, that now is the best time actually to engage your customers in a niche that uh, is uh, is relevant um, as one of the things we do for for our entrepreneurs is actually as i said knowledge sharing and we try to put them together with uh, some mentors uh, which are uh, international business leaders and recently we had a webinar with a, a big investor uh, international investor and he said that he's pushing their companies to, to invest in client engagement because now it's the the cheapest um, the cheapest cost of engaging your customers. He said it's sinful currently not to engage your, not to invest in engaging your customers. Exactly for the same reason, because now a dollar now is worth more than a dollar uh, six months. In February, yeah. Right. And uh, also, uh, this is actually a great advantage for, for companies from our region. Um, because uh, before in the in the noisy environment that was overflowing with capital and uh, liquidity, um, the companies from markets like ours, smaller markets, under um, under invested markets, were finding it difficult to uh, to get heard, to to, to be seen in, on the international scene. Now that uh, the international scene is much quieter, and there is a lot less capital. Uh, being available uh, for for the big players now in this liquid state um, of the economy, smaller companies have much better chances to to get to uh, get in front of the um, the much bigger clients. And, and I mentioned um, earlier on Tiger Technology. Uh, now they get the, the chance to to talk to major customers um, abroad, like the. Las Vegas uh, International Airport or the largest healthcare operator in the in the US um, that previously they had no chance to to get to because of the you know big boys like Microsoft Amazon etc cetera, etc cetera. right you you just touched upon the local and the international perspective and these were quite valuable thoughts and advices but I, I would also love to ask you what are the best practices that you saw uh, during those two months and like probably longer term uh, things that have been started uh, companies have started to apply uh, what's the situation in those 40 different markets where you're operating what what do you see there as endeavor it's a mixed bag obviously um uh, mainly because uh, the different countries are um at different stages of the crisis and feeling it in a, in a different way. Uh, mostly uh, the focus is on liquidity, especially in markets, uh, again, that were blessed, but now are suffering, uh, that were previously blessed with uh, abundance of capital and the companies were used to uh, the easy access of capital. Uh, now, the, the pendulum has uh, swung in, in the other direction. There is no capital whatsoever. So uh, liquidity is a big issue there. Uh, first of all, of course, it's, um, uh, it's focused on, 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 on the cost base. As Christy put it, um, uh, need, uh, the, the difference between nice to have and need to have things. Uh, another major focus is on the team. Um, I'm, I was quite happy to hear the new mode, or probably that's a new endeavor, who knows. But overwhelmingly, what we heard from other entrepreneurs in the other countries is that the focus should be on people. And um, because we saw how difficult until recently it is to, uh, to find the right people, to find the quality people when you need them. So now the effort is uh, to try to keep your quality people um, as long as possible and to keep them motivated for, uh, for as long as possible. 
and not to overreact and um, you know cut uh, cut your headcount immediately. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, the other major theme was relevance, uh, as we already discussed, and third was the impact. And um, we saw a lot of companies that um, actually extended their their capacity, their resources into some of uh, some forms of social impact being either you know a delivery company that starts to uh, to help elderly people to to get food um, or um, edutech companies or health tech companies naturally providing their services for free etc cetera, etc cetera, which is great for the society on one hand but as we said it's also a great way to get new customers and uh, if you are uh, uh, genuine in your, uh, in your efforts to help them, then you generate loyalty. And when all this will, be, will end inevitably one day, you will have these customers. So yes, it's tough on the, on, on, on the P&L, but it's now the time to engage your customers. Uh, I, would, uh, I would add to that that uh... Now it's the best time to be an entrepreneur because uh, given the fact that it's the, one of the cheapest times to engage with your uh, potential customers, uh, now is the easiest time to, uh, to, to try new products, to try uh, MVPs, uh, to try a different value proposition, to pivot. So uh, if, if you're an entrepreneur, and you already have a, a product, uh, but you're looking for that product market fit, or if you're a, a, a bigger bigger company and uh, you already are doing uh, multiple products in different sales channels and different geographies, uh, but you have several ideas that are, have been sitting on the shelf uh, for like three years and saying, uh, uh, we're going to do it tomorrow. Uh, now it's the great time to actually put some resources there and uh, pivot or do MVPs and uh, get several out there and uh, spend uh, several thousand euros on, uh, on, uh, on marketing and see basically what traction you get and uh, what results you have. Do you think that's applicable also for like smaller companies? Because sometimes entrepreneurs do have many ideas, not that everything could be executed and it could be, especially in these times, quite uh, overwhelming the whole thing. Uh, absolutely, I don't think it's an issue of being uh, small or big here. It's it's about being agile and uh, and uh, as Christo mentioned, you know, taking uh, the crisis itself uh, and being prudent, being uh, um, resilient does not exclude risk taking. Actually, now is the best time to to be quick in. Uh, taking uh, on opportunities, uh, making mistakes and uh, moving forward. Um, I don't think it's an issue of, uh, of scale. We've seen big companies um, pivoting, uh, you know, back in the days. Um, I can think of a few, uh, probably a name that come, I recently was talking about this, um, a large German company back in the days called Prozac, uh, that used to be the pillar of um, the um, coal and steel industry in the in in Germany uh, in the years after the World War II, um, eventually pivoted into a completely different uh, set of business when the coal uh, and the cost of labor increased in 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 Germany and become what we know now as uh, TUI, the tourist company. And who knows what TUI will become uh, after after this crisis uh, in a couple of years. Um, and for smaller companies, it's even easier. All right. Um, we have like 10 minutes till the official end of the session. Of course, we can stay longer. Uh, and I, I will ask you to do something a bit different here. Uh, it would be, I'll ask you the following questions, several questions. And please, Momchi, can you try to ask from the perspective of a historian? Because you're kind of doing that already. And Christo, uh, from your other natural role as a rather futurist. 
think that would be quite an interesting um, experiment. So I am the I am the Christo because now <laughs> I'm to read science fiction. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, can, you can also discuss those perspectives, but please. You are the historian, Mom. Actually, I'm, li I'm, I'm reading right now Leonardo, so it's... Uh, <laughs> are you still oh, okay. Interesting. All right. Well, let's then see. Uh, what do you think will be the new, no new normal? What will it look like? And will it be something that we've never seen before? Me? Christian? Mom, you go. It, as Christo said, it will be something that we have not seen before. Uh, our generation, a couple of generations back, we have not seen anything like this. Uh, it doesn't mean, though, that the world has not seen such a thing. Um, this, the world as such, not the human civilization itself, if you wish, has seen a lot of changes. We've been through four mass extinctions, if you wish, on this planet. Um, there were countless of major civilizations that went by. Um, so um, we've been through crises and we've survived. It's uh, in the human nature to survive somehow. I mean, ever since the dinosaurs, you know, left us some space to, to evolve, uh, we are doing this. Um, so the new normal, it really depends how long it's gonna take. Um, psychology uh, preaches that um, if, um, if a certain state um, lasts longer, um, we can change our habits. Some claim it takes 66 days, other would say longer, but certain aspects of our behavior will change. Um, unfortunately, I don't see myself going to a concert in the next year or so. Uh, and I'm really sorry because I missed the last U2 tour. Um, travel will be a challenge uh, one way or another. But as we can see on the streets uh, these days in Sofia, um, people are reverting back to, uh, to their old habits quite quickly um, because they, they didn't have the time to get used to the, um, old, uh, to the new sort of norms of behavior. So it, it's going to be a big bag um, and uh, it's an evolution. We're not going to wake up one day and see the world completely different. Oh, thank you, Vista. Uh, <laughs> well, um, I'm thinking several, several, uh, in several directions. So first of all, we might experience uh, over the next like uh, coming years and decades uh, part of the manufacturing and uh, production and industrial uh, businesses being brought back to CE. Uh, so coming out of uh, China, we saw what happened with the supply chains. Uh, for some of the components and the, the, the businesses, I think some of the uh, some of the uh, production and, uh, and manufacturing is going to come back to Central Eastern Europe as a hub for Europe uh, to, uh, to do production. So I think this might be a very positive trend. This is one coupled together with, um, with the fact that uh, probably in every device that is above $20, $30 is going to be connected to the internet. Uh, uh, I think we, we, we will be looking at a very interesting uh, surrounding. Uh, let's say we are, uh, let's say we're 2030 and we experience uh, a new, uh, a new pandemic. So uh, instead of, uh, instead of like today, which is, uh, you don't know what you have, uh, how it is, you don't know your state, uh, just imagine that uh, my sleeping mattress uh, is connected to the internet and uh, shares exactly my sleep uh, and everything. Uh, the glasses that I wear measure my temperature and my, uh, I don't know, like my sweating and uh, whatever. The watch uh, or the or the shirt uh, measures my uh, uh, my pulse. Uh, can do an ECG, uh, measures my temperature. Again, I don't know. Uh, something, uh, something that I can put uh, in this device, like uh, something that uh, that the guys uh, 
uh, that the Bulgarian startup is doing a camera can scan me and see if my lungs are well, if, uh, if, uh, if I have a headache. And all of this is done naturally and is building my, my let's say, my, uh, my um, health profile. And this is being fed directly Uh, okay. is gathering the profile of 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 all users centrally uh, into the government uh, and uh, they can immediately track all of the patients that are, that have uh, respiratory syndromes or they can immediately give uh, statistics on uh, how many people have higher temperature than normal uh, they can immediately do the areas and can do the uh, like the lockdowns on very specific neighborhoods or even uh, uh, like residential areas rather than uh, like the whole city or the whole country. And they can track an outbreak and limit it very, very fast. So uh, I'm thinking that, uh, that we will be living in uh, like uh, five to 10 years in an ultra connected uh, uh, digital society. And uh, I guess the challenge with that will be uh, privacy, uh, data, uh, because the information will be even more sens sen you know, sensible that, than it is today, sensitive. So, hmm, but I think it's, uh, it will be a very, very interesting times. <laughs> Just to, to, um, to build on what Chris was saying, I do believe that um, if this crisis uh, was happening 10, 20 years ago, we would have suffered a lot, a lot more. Exactly because of um, uh, this lack of connectivity, um, the information was spreading fast even 20 years ago. So we would have been panicking uh, all the same, but uh, we wouldn't have had uh, the tools uh, to stay connected and to continue operate in more or less normal uh, normal mode uh, that we have now, and as he said, in twenty years, it's going to accelerate even probably more. Right. And 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 let's face it; I mean, uh, pandemias are are a natural uh, thing. So, uh, from for the last uh, ten years, uh, this is not the first, and it's not the last. It's just that this is a global event. But we had SARS, we had MERS, we had uh, Ebola before that. So it's. Uh, uh, I, I don't expect this uh, this thing to end. Right. Do you think is that um, definition and metrics of high uh, high impact entrepreneurship will change? Um, no, I don't think so. I think they will become more relevant. Um, yes, actually, one point. If, we, if you consider high impact, the fast paced growth, that would probably change. Um, I believe that um, we will, until the next boom period, <laughs> we will forget a little bit about uh, fast growth and growth on, uh, at any cost, and we'll focus more on, uh, more on sustainability. Uh, on sustainability of the business model, on sustainability of our behavior, uh, hopefully. Um, other than that, um, um, I think things that were features of the high impact sustainable, uh, high impact entrepreneurship, like um, give back, um, will become more relevant. Uh, truly believe and hope that uh, collaborative. Um, um, way of thinking and collaborative way of working will become even more relevant because in, in the good times, um, we probably can make it on our own. In tough times, we have to stick together. After all, if I have to put my historian hat again, um, that was the collaborative um, behavior actually g gave us an edge as a species compared to the other um, you know, human uh, species that existed um, <laughs> throughout the history. So collaboration is very important uh, these days. 
Chris, do you want to add something or shall I ask the next, que next question? <laughs> ask the next question. <laughs> so, is it the right time to scale a business right now? It's always the right time. <laughs> it depends wh wh where you are, of course. If, uh, if you're in the growth uh, stages, uh, if, if you're in the growth sections, of part of your business that is, uh, it's, uh, there is, there is no better time because unless you scale it, someone else is going to enter that niche instead of you. Uh, I can give a, uh, I can give an example with, uh, with online groceries where right now you have dozens of, uh, and hundreds of, uh, new entrants to the category. So if you are in a growing uh, niche like online groceries and you don't scale your effort, uh, you are being overwhelmed by hundreds of new players uh, entering the, the space. So if you have a scale opportunity and you don't use it, uh, you're going to miss your, mm. your window. And is it, is it time to fundraise right now? If yes, for what? For me, it's always time to fundraise because especially now, like Momchi said, uh, all of the questions that entrepreneurs ask themselves are how much liquidity do I have? And if you have the opportunity to increase your liquidity, you should use it. What do you think should be the pitch? I, I need to increase my liquidity or rather uh, like share some big vision for ahead. Has that, has that changed now? Even if you, even if you can raise, even, even if you can get a loan from the bank, I would get a loan from the bank. True, true. So everything that increases your liquidity right now, um, is a is a major step forward um as to your question about the message um it's again not something that um uh was triggered by the crisis it's something that uh, um, already was was happening a few months or a year ago um following the the spectacular uh, failures of we work and uh, and uber for example investors started to be more focused again on the, on the sustainability. They still look for growth, obviously, because that's how they make money, but um, they, they do uh, try to see and try to hear from the entrepreneurs uh, a sensible uh, plan, how this growth will be achieved uh, and uh, how um, soon uh, there will be um, you know, a, a sustainability or profitability um, in in the company. Right. I really think we should uh, discuss this question from the audience because it's super interesting. Chris to briefly answered it, but I think it deserves a bit more time. <laughs> Do you think the crisis will accelerate collaboration implementation between, uh, for example, physical companies, factories, in Plovdiv and other industrial centers and startups that are being developed uh, in Sofia, for example? What do you think, Momchi? You were recently there, like not recently, but like I think it was last year or the year before when you had there to scale in Plovdiv. So you have an overview. Mm -hmm. um, I do think so, actually, and I have an example, uh, some examples about this. Um, Christo mentioned um, uh, a feature of the crisis that inevitably is going to um, uh, to loom large uh, in the in the next months and years, and that is the shortening of the supply chains. And uh, for example, one of our companies, um, Antal Lopaldio, they are a global leader in um, high-end um, audio recording equipment, and most of their parts were until recently produced um, in China, of course. Uh, they they were faced with an issue of uh, growing demand because people are um, uh, staying at home and they're playing with um, with music. Obviously, they want to record and entertain themselves, and they uh, but they couldn't get the parts in, so they turned to local suppliers and uh, managed to quickly find um, for most parts. Of course, not for everything, but for quite a few things, they managed to find suitable local suppliers. Um, to work with, and uh, you know, this is a, a collaboration between 
uh, what you would call a startup, although it's a scale up in our um, in our view, with the local uh, sort of uh, manufacturing businesses. And Plovdiv is a great example because they, they, they have developed a great manufacturing base there, which will serve not only the Bulgarian startups, but hopefully, um, as Christo mentioned, uh, Europe-wide uh, supply chains. Um, do you see a, an opportunity for like uh, industry 4.0 solutions emerging in the next years, like as a result of what just happened? It's okay. uh, you, 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 I, I lost the question you, you brought up. Do you see an opportunity? Uh, it's related to your answer in the chat, actually. Do you see um, opportunities for 4.0 solutions in the next series emerging? And how uh, do I have to open the eyes of the old blind business? Yeah, it's uh, well, the good thing about uh, a crisis is that you don't have to do uh, anything. Their eyes are being opened by the fact that uh, no one is buying uh, their products anymore and that uh, they need to to go through the digital transformation uh, wanted or not so uh, so you don't have to <laughs> to do this effort so uh, but this 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 doesn't mean that uh, you you know you don't need to do any work you know you still need to go after them and uh, chase them but now they're completely more open now it's a totally different game. Now it's uh, uh, physical is coming to digital saying, please uh, save us from this nightmare. <laughs> it's not the other way around. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, digital has always been like 5, 10, 15% of, uh, let's say, a physical business. Uh, but right now we're seeing uh, very, very quick uh, shifts and moves uh, in that space. I think the Bulgarian education system is a, is a fine example. Uh, it's been, um, uh, you know, set in uh, in the past uh, for too long now, and uh, it's been, you know, probably five percent digitized until recently. Currently, it's hundred percent digitized, one way or another. <laughs> uh, it's been basically dragged into the digital era by this crisis, and that's a good thing. It definitely is. Well. Guys, uh, I would suggest we wrap it up. One last question and I'll let you do what you do because uh, I don't want to be one of those conferences that are like half an hour late. Um, and the question is actually to you. Um, what is the one question that you uh, expect to be asked and no one asks you, but you think you have a great answer to? <laughs> Momchi, I think this is for you. <laughs> uh, no, that's a difficult oh, yeah. one. Uh, that's a difficult one. Yeah, I'm not giving you this answer this time, Alexandra. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Every time I'm persistent. Uh, <laughs> um, I guess um, I guess um, it's uh, a bit more on, on a personal level. Um, you know, we we have to start asking ourselves. Uh, we stop. Uh, we have to stop asking ourselves for whom the ball, uh, the, the bell tolls, and um, and realize that um, it's about us. Uh, it's um, uh, it's what we are going to do in this situation uh, that makes a difference. Nobody's going to deliver it to to us. Um, and it's um, in times like this, uh, it's actually important to be proactive. Um, be extra helpful to um, to others, um, and realize that we are part of a of a society. And it's um, you know the, um, the, actually a question that I was discussing recently is about the game theory. It's not the time, as in the game theory, it's not the time to try to maximize your own benefit, because then you might have some chance to win, but everybody else will lose, and at the end the game um, is smaller. Um, it's actually a time to uh, to collaborate and uh, and thus you know help uh, the whole system to grow and um, everyone will have a better chance not just to survive but to make it uh, in a much better position. 
I also ha might have uh, <laughs> uh, an idea uh, or two. So uh, I have been receiving uh, tremendous support ever since the crisis started. So I've received support uh, number one from my team uh, with who we had to basically take uh, tough decisions. Uh, and uh, I've also incre uh, received uh, increased support from the from my network. And uh, one question Next one to me is why do you receive that support? And uh, the reason, okay. the reason Can you repeat I the question that, because I think it dropped for a minute and we didn't yeah. hear it. So, so, so one of the questions uh, is uh, that someone would like to ask me is that why do I get that support? Why do I get support from the team or from the from the community? Uh, and, and the answer is that uh, I have been there for them. Uh, during the times of not being in a crisis. So uh, during the, 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 the times I have, I have been there for them and I'm, and I'm still there for them during the times of a crisis. So to anyone who maybe is feeling a little bit more miserable right now, or is thinking that uh, they didn't get enough support from someone, well, ask yourselves, have you been giving uh, the support that you now want, uh, uh, you know, over the last one, two, five, ten years to the people around you? And then if, and you have to be honest, and if the answer is no, well, don't expect to, to, to get anything back when the times are tough. Right. Thank you so much for this enlightening conversation. I really think it brought a lot of value and there will be recording for everyone who couldn't listen to it. Um, I want to just remind, I, I really think we switched a bit the mindset and people who entered that with fear and uh, confusion will, will most probably now have better ideas of how to continue that um, like the journey. Um, I want to remind that Dare to Scale, the program of Endeavor that is for rather early stage entrepreneurs, will be opening applications uh, on the 1st of June, if I'm right, Mochi? Yep, that's right. Thank yeah. you. And I yep. think that's uh, quite an interesting opportunity for, for everyone who just got some ideas and insights and want to explore the mindset that Endeavor are bearing a bit more deeper. So with that, thank you so much and see you in the next days during the big reset. Thank you. Thank you bye so bye. much, Alex. Thank bye. you. Bye. Bye-bye.